stop giving speeches. Start delivering experiences. Stop giving speeches and start delivering experiences. When you do that, that's the first way to get your audience to love you and you can shine on stage when you give them an experience and not just a speech. And today I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna share with you a few ideas that I believe will help you to elevate your level of excellence on the platform, be it a virtual platform or a physical stage. One of the keys is you want your audience to love you. If you feel that way, use the reaction button, give me a thumbs up, give me a wave, use some balloons. If you want your audience to love you, let me see a reaction. Let's have a good conversation today. Thank you so much. I see thumbs up. I see physical hands being waved, which I really appreciate. You know, being a presenter gives you a wonderful opportunity but also a responsibility. Today, I'm kind of blessed. I have an advantage. I get to be the leadoff hitter, to use a, ba a baseball term. I get to be the first speaker, the first one out of the gate. One of the first ways, before you even go on stage, you can get the audience to like you, is to get to know them. I call it building before rapport. For some here, we've built a little before rapport. What that means is, before you say a word on stage, ask yourself, do I have any opportunity to interact with my audience before my presentation to get them to like me before I deliver my first word? Those who were in the networking room earlier know I joined that room. I said a few words. I answered a question to give those who are unfamiliar with me a chance to get to know who I am. In a live conference situation, you can build before rapport, you can get your audience to like you before you deliver your presentation by interacting with them, being personable and using your personality. Because very often your audience might see you as a speaker, but you want them to know that you and they have something in common. Build before rapport, have a conversation, greet people, say hello, make a new friend if possible. It can be more difficult at times in a virtual setting, especially if they place you in a small room with only a few people. In a live event, shake a few hands, smile, ask questions, introduce yourself. Let them see you as a person, not only as a presenter. I'll repeat that. Let the audience see you as a person not only as a presenter. I said earlier, I have an advantage as a first speaker. I don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, I had to follow Fersico Twaco and Patricia Fripp and they were awesome. I get to be first. So my responsibility is to deliver my gift and hopefully inspire you all with a good message. However, sometimes you'll find you may not be the first speaker on a program. You may be second or third, and in some events, they may have four speakers back to back to back to back. You're number three, and speaker number one was good. Speaker number two was great. And maybe you're thinking, OMG, I've got to follow Pamela Benjamin? How in the world am I going to do that? Well, I have a tip for you. Here it is. Have, give me a reaction. Have you ever been to an event where they had, you know, two or three speakers back to back, and, and when one speaker was finished, audience members saw it in their minds as a quick break. They went for their mobile phone. Oh yeah, I got to text my girlfriend. Yeah, she's so good. Or they go for their purse. Oh, I run to the restroom. What happens is very often the audience gets a sense of end of chapter one, chapter two is going to begin. And their minds wonder. But sometimes you find yourself in a place where you have to respond right away and win them right away. Here, is a couple of, here are a couple of suggestions for you. When you're introduced, and hopefully you'll get a wonderful introduction as I received today from Franca, and quite frankly, very, very, very few times do I get a better introduction, so thank you for that. But you want to give your audience time to adjust to you. This may sound arrogant, I suggest you want your audience to come to your house. I suggest you want the audience to come to your house. Let me explain that to you. After hearing a really great speaker, 
the audience says, man, that was good. They'll take some notes. They'll remember what he or she said. But you have the responsibility to bring the audience eyes on you. There are a couple of ways to do this. One, when you take the platform, you'll notice I did not speak right away. I've been a Toastmaster now for over 25 years. And very often in our zeal to deliver our messages, once we're introduced, we go speaking. It often happens in contests as well. I'm introduced, name, title, title, name, boom, and I go. No, relax. Take a moment. Feel your space. Own the room. They are now in my house. Make eye contact. Here, it's very easy. I focus on my friends behind a lens. In a live audience setting, I suggest you look to your right, to the middle, to the left, make eye contact with the audience. Because if you don't, the audience may assume you're in your head trying to make sure your opening is perfect and you are concerned about the mechanics of your presentation, but not the heart of the presentation. So pause, take a moment, let them see you, how comfortable you are, how relaxed you are, how ready you are to serve them. And the mindset is one of service. And when you are ready, begin your presentation. I will tell you that moment of that pause before you speak can be powerful. That pause almost forces your audience to bring their minds back to you. I want to risk right now and tell you that there's a speaker in the last 80 years who was a master at this. I speak of their expertise, not particularly of their personality or what they are known for. But there's one particular speaker who was the master of the pause before you present. Pause before you present. His name? Adolf Hitler. If you watch a video of his speeches, you will see at times he'll come on the platform. He will stand for as long as 60 seconds while the audience gets into a frenzy. They can't wait to hear what he has to say. His technique was masterful. What I've learned in the last 27 years is when you pause before you present, the audience's eyes, hearts, and minds now turn to you. You have their attention, and they want to hear what you have to say. Now, you and I as speakers have the responsibility of saying something valuable. But from a technical standpoint, owning the stage and shining on stage begins ultimately before you even say a word. Now, I was told that you want to make sure the audience sees you and gets your attention. So do me a favor, in the chat, in one word, could you tell me, in your, to your mind and understanding, what is the purpose of your opening in a presentation? In one word, what do you think it is? Type in the chat. Help me out here. Engage. Engage, engage. Attention, focus, impact, attention, captivate, connect, engage, connect, attention, capture. In okay, wonderful. I'm getting connect, I'm getting attention, I'm getting engagement a lot. I heard this many, many years ago. The purpose of the, a good opening is to get the audience's attention. That's a common thing. Quick, my reaction, give me a thumbs up. Have you ever heard someone say, the purpose of the opening is to get their attention? Give me a thumbs up or a physical thumbs up. Yes, nothing wrong with that. That's actually correct because it also engages them. They're similar. But it's only half correct, in my opinion. Let me explain. In my experience, in my opinion, the purpose is to get their attention, but also to make a connection. To get their attention and make a connection. And if you do it really, really well, that connection piece is actually twofold. Once again, allow me to explain. When you get their attention, you want to connect with them. Now, if you have had a chance to establish before rapport, you have an advantage. But if you can connect with the audience in your opening, that's a plus. The second part of connect is if you can connect to the audience individually, but also connect your audience to your subject, that's a bonus. To get their attention, to connect with them personally, but also connect with your subject. I believe I did that today, and maybe it was subtle you didn't see it. Let's go back and rewind to my opening, shall we? Okay, v 
Videotape is now rewound. Thank you for that laugh. I appreciate that. Thank you, <laughs> Krish. Okay. I said, stop giving speeches. Start giving experiences. My whole subject is how can you shine online and on stage? You shine by going beyond the speech to giving the audience an experience. So my opening connected me to you how we all give speeches. We're connected. But to my topic, start giving experiences and in that way you will shine on stage and online. Will every opening accomplish this? Perhaps not. But if you can open, yes, to get their attention, but also to make a connection to your audience and if possible to your subject, that gives you the advantage of not having to get to work your way to winning them over. I hope you find that helpful. Thank you for the comment. Thank you. Luzena, you like that? Yes. If we can connect to the audience and topic at the same time, it saves us time. And the cool part is it gives us the opportunity to invest the rest of our time in content, subject matter, or stories, or humor, and everything we have worked so hard to give to the audience, which may be from here to here. But you want to shine on stage by having that connection first. Now, I will tell you this. To many people, shining on stage or online in their mind is about the physical mechanics of presenting. And I certainly will talk a little bit about that. But what's also important is to understand that you shine on stage and online with your content, with your delivery, with your mechanics, with your purpose, with your vision, and with your objective to reach to the audience, touch their hearts, and give them something of value. You will hear me use the word value several times today because I believe our purpose as presenters is to give the audience value. Unfortunately, in my Toastmasters journey, I've met so many people whose goal is to become good speakers and they focus heavily on the mechanics and sometimes it can be light on the material. Hopefully, after today, we'll get a nice mix, a nice amalgam of both and our presentations will become experiences for our audiences. Now, we are challenged with engaging. I saw engagement. Several people said engagement, engagement, engagement. How do we always engage? There are obvious methods. One, of course, is, is to get the audience to respond, either by putting in the chat virtually, using an emoticon in the chat virtually, physically raising their hands, moving in some way, responding or answering our questions. That may seem difficult virtually, but we've done it today so far. I've got thumbs up. I've got applause. I've got smiley faces from emoticons. I've had chat responses, and you are engaged in my presentation in the first few minutes. That's a form of engagement. I've even had some people here physically raise their hand from where you are. And I've seen some nods as well. Please help me out. Raise your hand physically if you've ever had difficulty engaging your audience. Anybody? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. I know you can't, we can't see everyone's gallery view, but I have to smile because you just helped me to make a point. There are times, particularly in a live setting, on a, virtual, on a physical stage, where the engagement becomes physical and the audience will join you because you've activated what psychologists call the mirror neurons. I'm no psychologist, I'm no psychotherapist, I'm no psychoanalyst, I'm no psycho anything, and I'm no psycho. But I've learned that the mirror neurons can be activated. You lead, the audience follows. I said, please raise your hand if. And I suspect, before I said a word, there are individuals here whose hands are going to go up. I'll prove it to you. My lovely wife, Andrea, and I met in Jamaica back in 1977. And back in 1979, we went to a play in Kingston, Jamaica, a very humorous play at a place called a Little Theater on Town Redcomb Avenue in Kingston. I know Roxanne, I see you no, I I I not in already. You know where it is, right? There was one particular actor who was hilariously funny. He was first a good talker times five. So funny this guy was. And he delivered a line. The audience burst out laughing. My girlfriend Andrew's next to me. And then a second line came, and the laughter doubled. And my, my girlfriend, Andrea, she was just doubling over. She was laughing so hard. And I chose to ask her a question. I said, honey, do you hear what he said? 
She said, <laughs> no, <laughs> but it was funny anyway. Everyone else had begun to laugh. And she simply followed along because laughter is contagious. And you'll find sometimes in your presentation, you raise your hand. Can you relate to that? Have you been there before? Oh, what happens? The audience, there you go. Look at that. You're, that's what you're doing already. There you go. I simply activate your mirror neuron to get you to respond, but it tells me something as a presenter. It tells me I have engaged you. It tells me you are listening. You double down by using eye contact, by smiling, by nodding your head. And there are people in the audience who will follow along because it tells you they are with you. And to them, you are shining because they are engaged. They want to be involved in the process. They want to feel a part of the program. And when you have your audience in a virtual environment, type in the chat, respond to a poll, give a reaction, you are telling them, I value your opinion. I want to know what you think. Not just that you're paying attention. When I ask for your chat input, I want to know what you think. I want to know your opinion. And when the audience believes you care about them, they'll feel more engaged. When the audience feels some individual attention, they'll feel engaged. In a, in a breakout earlier, I mentioned earlier my fellow Mount Vernon resident. Because I, somebody's there. I, I call up my fellow Jamaican Roxanne because she's Jamaican. And someone said, he hardly has an accent. I do that for you, my fellow Toastmasters. I know you are global. But I will com I'll promise you this. If I got Roxanne by herself, I want to ask her some questions, and yeah, she would talk. Not true, Roxanne. You know what I talk about, right? Yeah, man, every time. That's how it's there. But I respect my audience enough to make enough modifications so you can understand me. Let me make a point very quickly here. Part of who you are on stage is exactly that. It's who you are. Now, I know my accent is not strong right now, but for those of you... Every one of us, including all of us who are here, all 165 and a half of us, we all have accents. It may sound normal to us, somebody else, that's an accent. And there are individuals I know who want to shine on stage, so they modify their accent so much, there is no hint of their history. Here's my thought. Your accent is an asset. Don't lose it. Use it. Your accent is an asset. Don't lose it. Use it. By bringing your whole self, your history, your personality to your presentation, that's part of how you shine. It's part of your uniqueness. It's part of the experience your audience gets from being with you for 20 minutes or 40 minutes or an hour or three minutes if you get three minutes. Bring yourself to the presentation. Yes, you work hard, you focus on your material, on the technical content. That's only part of it. Your delivery and who you are is what makes that content me more meaningful to that audience on that day at that time. You could take every single word I take, I say, and give it to someone else and they can deliver it, but they must deliver it as they would. Bring your whole person to your presentation. When you get your audience to interact, to engage, you get them to, to activate mirror neurons, you let them know their input is important and valuable, now you're having more of a conversational ex experience and not just a lecture. Again, and I know some Toastmasters who lack experience are focused on delivering the content, and I love that. But you want to give the audience an experience, and one of the ways to do that is to think of the language you use when you're presenting. I made this mistake very, very early on when I joined Toastmasters way back in 1993 in the previous millennium. And I'm a bit scared to realize there may be individuals on the Zoom today who may not have been born back in 1993 when I began my Toastmasters journey. But that is, oh, thank you, Franca. I feel really good now. You know what? It's okay. I can wear the gray beard worthily. I think I, can, I, think I earned that. One of, my pro one of my problems was, my issue, my mistake, was to use the language I love. Now understand this, I'm a self-confessed word nerd. How nerdy am I? High school, Jamaica, 1973, at an all-boys high school called Calabar High School in Kingston. In the classroom, English class, a student next door knocked on the door, 
Sir, excuse me, sir. What do you want, boy? Sir, um, can I borrow a dictionary, please, sir? And my classmate said, Hey, Brown, this kid want to talk to you. Ha, 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 ha. Because they knew I would read the dictionary for fun. So my problem was I would write my speeches in the way I would read. I was writing for the eye and not for the ear. I was sounding too sophisticated. I was sounding officious. Ideally, you want to be as conversational as possible. For example, in your presentation, if you, you said, well, you know, Andrea and I, we enjoyed a leisurely promenade down the walkway on a breezy summer evening. Sounds nice. But if I told you it was summer, it was breezy, it was cool, and Andrea and I went for a walk, and it was so lovely just to spend time with my wife. That's more conversational. I don't need the fancy words, but you get the idea. The experience becomes real when you, I'm not saying dispense with large words. I'm saying use them in a measured fashion. Ask yourself, if I were telling this story to my friends at Starbucks or Jimmy John's or Tim Hortons or somewhere else, would I use that language? Would I sound the way that I sound as I see this? Am I conversational enough? You shine when you are authentic. You shine when you are authentic. And one of my mark-isms, one of my mantras is authenticity plus vulnerability equals credibility. Authenticity plus vulnerability equals credibility. What's the vulnerability? Be honest about who you are. Tell your story. You want to shine? Tell your story. I attended a Toastmasters conference many years ago in another part of the world. I'm not going to tell you where it was. And I witnessed a speech contest, and I've seen many in the last 27, 28, 29 years. And an individual got on stage, and he, this particular person, they were masterful with their technique. They were very fluent. The words flowed without a hitch, no ums, no ahs, no you knows, no verbal pauses. In terms of the content on a judge's worksheet, whoo, hoo, 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 man, they hit every mark. When the contest was over, the individual did not win, place, or show, to use a horse racing metaphor, and I was not surprised for one particular reason. As fluent and as smooth and as eloquent as they were, they told the story of some of a famous athlete who had overcome an obstacle to achieve a goal. And I thought to myself, anyone in the room could have delivered that presentation because I learned absolutely, positively, and I made those two words up, I learned absolutely, positively nothing about the presenter. They didn't tell us their story. One way to shine on stage and online is to tell your story. Your story need not be sensational. It only needs to be sincere. I'll repeat that. Your story need not be sensational. It only has to be sincere. I often hear, Mark, you don't understand. I have no great story to tell. You are amazing, Mark. You, you came to America. You were 18. You had 40 bucks in your pocket, and now you're a world champion. What a great story you have. I don't have that. Listen, you don't need to have to climb Mount Everett, Everest, barefoot, backwards, uphill, both days, in the middle of winter to have a story. Your story has to be just authentic enough and vulnerable enough for your audience to relate to your story. Case in point, by show of hands or reaction, if I were to tell you all the stories of all the astronauts I've known or met or heard about or read about, how easily could you relate to the experience of going in space and walking on the moon? Not very easily. Because here's why. Your audience, for the most part, is you. Your audience, for the most part, is you. And the experiences that you have every single day are more common to your audience than you may think. 
We often think I need a spectacular standout story, but you don't. Think about the Toastmasters World Championship the last several years. Last year's first virtual champion, Mike Carr, talked about being in school with a faulty projector he tried to fix. Wow, what an amazing life-threatening story that was. Or was it? You look at Aaron Beverly, talked about going to a wedding in a foreign country. I talked about watching a Disney cartoon with my kids and seeing a woman on TV who was misfeeling because she, because she appeared to be poor and destitute. Think about this. The speeches that we know that win our world championship are hardly spectacular, but they are relatable to us. So the authenticity and the vulnerability of your own story gives you credibility that lets your audience lean in. And that's partly how we shine on stage, by sharing our story, our experience. Now, in our stories, we often have characters. And what's important is we want the characters to be real, to come alive. We want them to be almost three-dimensional. There are a couple of ways to do that. The first is what I call creating the scene so we can relate to the characters. I learned that from my dad, the late Ransford W. Brown, who used to read, my brother, my sister, and me, used to read us bedtime stories when we were small kids in Jamaica, way back in the 1950s. Okay, the 1960s. Okay, it's, it's okay. I, I have no shame about my age. Next month, I'll be 60 years old, but I look good. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> And I call, my father used to read to us the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And he gave me what I call the Goldilocks effect. My father would say, Papa Bear said, somebody was sitting in my chair. Mama Bear said, somebody ate my porridge. And of course, there was a baby bear who said, somebody was sleeping in my bed and there she is. All my dad did was, a, was take on the voice of a character. And in my little mind, at grade eight, six, and seven, he became that character. I call that the Goldilocks effect. Three words become the characters. Become the characters. And that becomes more meaningful to us if we make one more change to some of our content. One more Markism. Don't report transport. What do I mean by that? Very often we deliver our presentations in narrative form. We tell the audience about what happened. That's reporting. I say, take them to the scene, transport them there, set the scene, become the characters, let them see what was different. Physical movement, someone's gait, their movement, their face, their voice. These are small little tweaks we can make to our presentations. It begins with deciding when to narrate and when to go into character and use dialogue, because that becomes really meaningful. Now, Mark, hang on a second. We're doing virtual. <laughs> How do I become different people in, in a small space? Small adjustments can be used in a powerful way so the audience can see what's different. It could be, as my dad did, a difference in pitch. Papa Bear's voice was here. Mama Bear's voice was here. And Baby Bear was up here. Three different pitches to indicate three different characters. Don't need to go, ah, honey, don't do that. Okay, darling, I won't, I'm sorry. We don't need a dramatic change in the range, just enough for the audience to know it's a different character. Here's the cool part. You can practice and you can test. You can test, yes, you can test using Zoom. Really, how? I'll tell you, really, show me. Excellent. Record yourself with the characters. Play it back like this and listen to yourself. If you and a friend can identify different characters by simply the way you deliver the line or the pitch, then you know the audience can see a difference. You can double down on that as well. You could even use a different accent to indicate different people if you want. One person could have a really heavy accent like this, or a really bad French accent, if you feel comfortable doing that. What, another very simple way is to change the rate of speed 
at which a presenter speaks or a character in the story speaks. You could have one character who was always upbeat, real type of, Miss, listen, dude, I saw a car crash, two guys in a car crash, it's crazy, I think it's beating, you should go call somebody. Hey man, just calm down. What happened, let me know. You can tell two different characters. One is high pitched and fast, the other is slower, low pitch. Doesn't require much space being used. It's simply what the audience hears and experiences. Your pitch, the rate, the voice, and sometimes the face alone can make a really big difference. It's amazing what you can do with your face sometimes to let the audience know what emotions are being expressed. You can also use your body to transform a character. What do I mean by that? I guess one of my favorite uh, examples of this transformation took, came to me in a film I saw many, many years ago. Perhaps it was 1978 or 1980. An actor named Christopher Reeve was playing Clark Kent slash Superman way back when. If you know the, 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 that particular Superman, please let me know. Give me a, a thumbs up. Give me a wave if you saw him. Christopher Reeve, the late, great Christopher Reeve. There's a scene in one of the movies where he's with, with uh, Lois Lane and he's showing her, he, he wants to tell her, he's, he wants to tell her, I'm really Superman. And he's, and he's struggling in his mind, do I tell her, do I don't, do I not, do I tell her? But what he does in silence in the scene spoke to me from a dramatic standpoint about characterization. I want to share with you a couple of seconds of this particular scene so you can see what was going on here. Um, let's try and do this very, very quickly and let, let you see what happens here. Oh, they lied to me. Never mind, I'm going to stop sharing it's that. It's time that to help bad. people customize. Okay. Don't you hate when they do that to you? They put a, they put a, a commercial on there. It's all right. We're going to make it work. Okay, let's just do this right here. I'm going to have fun with this because life happens, right? When life happens, give it. At Must See Sports, Disney Plus, this. Hulu, and ESPN+. All right, here we go. All right. Lois, for goodness sake, didn't you hear me knocking? Uh-huh. Uh, Lois, we uh, did, did have a date tonight, uh, remember? Oh. Lois? Huh? You haven't been, um... Uh, huh? Oh, no, no. Well, I certainly hope not. Well, let's, uh, push off, shall we? I better get a coat. Uh, it might be kind okay. of cold. No, I mean, uh, I need a... Watch closely. Fix my hair and some blush on. Listen as well. Lois, there's something I have to tell you. I'm really... Um, I mean, I, I was, uh, at first, really nervous about tonight. Now, real quickly, what did he do? Clark Kent had his glasses on, and he came in, he had his voice on, Lois, uh, we we'll got tonight, and, uh, but he says, I want to tell her who I really am. They come off, he has his glasses, they come off, and he physically grows almost three inches. In that one move, then he says, Lois, I must tell you something, his voice changes. Then he decides against it, and you see him, uh, uh, well, I was going to uh, do it. And all he did was move his body from one place to another to become a different character. It is that simple to become a different character. And when you do that well and the audience sees it, it becomes not just what they see, it's what they experience. They see the real character in front of them. When we become the characters, the story is no longer one-dimensional and flat. It now becomes three-dimensional and they're beginning to experience what happens and you and I can do that I'm not saying to transform your presentation into a dramatic you know a one person play I'm not saying that but if our audience can identify the characters feel them sense them connect with them relate to them and the emotions that they experience then that's going to be important that is a simple but powerful use of our body 
There's something else we can do with our space as well. We can master the physical platform, be it on a large stage or within the confines of this little box we call the computer screen. By show of hands or by emoticon, have you found yourself challenged to portray characters in the small window of the virtual world? Anybody has been challenged by that? Yes, I, yeah, I see hands being moved in the dark all over. I go through my gallery. Thank you so much. All over the world. Woohoo! I'm loving this. I confess I have too. But I learned a few tips and tricks. I see my friend Panos is here from Greece. Thank you, Panos. Always good to see you, my friend. I've learned over time that we can still use our space well. Here's an idea for you. We know about leaning in. We certainly saw Mike Carr do much of that last year. And I saw Roxanne do it several times in her speech. You lean in. It's a really cool thing to do. And we have width. On a large stage, we have more room. I've seen people think, oh my goodness, I'm on the big stage. Maybe you're on the big stage one day and you thought, wow, I've never ever been on the stage. And you find yourself wanting to go to the left extreme and the right extreme. It's a big stage. I may as well use it. After all, I don't have to be on the red TED dot now, do I? And I saw one speaker do that one day, large audience, 2,000 people, and he chose to go to the very end of the stage to talk to the people over here and all the way over here and talk over here, not realizing by being so extreme, he had turned his back to part of the audience each time. All we need to do is use angles, make a walk to a distance, but use angles. They can still see me here. Angles still see me here. You can also use the depth of your stage. And of course, virtually, it may seem challenging, but you can use depth as well to portray certain things. And to my advantage, I have a wireless microphone. If your mic is attached to your camera, it may be a challenge, but right now there are so many options for inexpensive wireless body mics. If you know you'll be doing several virtual presentations, I recommend you get one. We often can say, oh, I fell so far away. Yes, yeah, so we have left and right. We have actors who block spots on stage to portray scenes. My friend Darren LaCroix calls those holograms of where a scene takes place. You don't want to be in a hospital room, somebody's dying, and then you go on, to your speech, go on through your speech, later on having a picnic in the same spot. The audience thinks, oh my goodness, a picnic in a hospital room? That's kind of weird. On a large scale you stage, you have more room for that. On a small platform like virtual, Select your spots carefully and purposefully and move there purposefully. There is something else. Yes, I can go left and I can go right. I can lean in. I can go back. But there's also the power of using the angles of the stage to tell stories, to give the audience a visual. When I was first in New York in the 1980s, my accent was much heavier. And I confess, I have modified it because I have spoken all over the world and I've tried to create a more continental accent that's understood globally. That's why I've modified it as I'm doing it today. But it wasn't always a strong suit with me. I was 19, 18, 19 years old, went to work for a bank in New York City on the Grand Concourse on Fordham Road in the Bronx, New York. And of course, I had my Jamaican accent as a kid just off the plane. And I was dealing as a bank teller with customers coming into this huge bank and they were New Yorkers. I do not mean to offend any New Yorker when I do this, but I would hear stuff like, are you doing Mark? Are you doing today? If you do okay, hey, get over here. Yeah, I'm talking to you, get over here. And the New Yorkers, you know, forget about it, right? But I did not speak as they did. And I found my customer saying, what? What do you say? What do you say, Sonny? Huh? What? And my confidence took a hit. Oh, yes. And after a while, I found myself just getting quieter and quieter and softer and eventually my voice would kind of trail off and it was really, and it only made things worse. What did you say? I felt the same way when I went to work at Reader's Digest, computer programming. And my, my buddies and I would always go to lunch together. We'd try to eat. Once in a while, I'd make an excuse and go back to my office because I hear my friends talking about their college days, the parties, the fun, the games they had. And I know I came to this country with eight, with 40 bucks at 18, no college training. And I felt inferior. And there were times I wanted to just back away, back away, back away and hide. 
I use not only front and back, virtually I'm using the angles to show how I recede. And I triple down, not double down. One, use the angle. Two, allow my voice to trail off. Three, show the posture of someone who is going through a difficult season of their life. You can do the same thing on the stage when you present. You can do the same thing even if you are challenged. You can do the same thing if you are challenged how you speak in, in, in your situation. You can have the same situation happen to you. But think, how can I use my stage to give the audience a better visual of what I'm dealing with? How can I do that effectively? That's the question you want to ask. Someone I know did that very, very well 12 years ago competing in the World Championship. Now, Mark Hunter is different. Mark Hunter is confined to a wheelchair because of an accident. But he did that very same technique with the angles in such a powerful way. I want to share it with you. I'll show you what he did very quickly. Here's Mark Hunter. At the age of 22, an accident completely changed my view of the world. Before the accident, I saw the world from the height of an invincible six feet. Now I see it from the height of a consummate navel gazer. <laughs> so I became short, seated, and recycled. <laughs> but I soon faced discrimination. So I became the modern day Don Quixote, fighting for the rights of those with a disability. Many, many times I would put on the armor of righteousness, mount my trusty gray horse, yeehaw! <laughs> Lower my lance and charge into hell for my heavenly cause, daring to dream of a world where discrimination no longer existed. But at other times, I would retreat, exhausted, and just want to become invisible. For many years, as I championed this call. Wow. Wow. Here is an individual who has what we would consider to be a disability, but for him, it became an asset. What he did with his wheelchair, it became his horse. He lowered his lance like a, like a knight and he rolled forward and he showed how he wanted to become invisible. He receded, he turned the chair away and lowered his head. Masterful use of his platform with the limitations that he had. So here's a question for you, my friends. What perhaps has limited you or do you think may have been a liability that you can then turn into an asset? Do you play an instrument? Are you adept at sleight of hand or are, are you an illusion, illusionist? Do you sing? What gift or talent can you bring to your presentation that will make your audience remember you, allow you to shine on stage and to drive home the point you make and reinforce it in your own unique way? Think of what you may be leaving on the table. A talent you've never tried or something that you could do but never ventured to do it. But, it. but it's you. It's part of who you are. Your audience wants your message. They want to hear you, but they, they want to know you. Another Mark Brownism. Your audience wants to hear you. And they really want to know you. Ideally, your audience wants to leave your presentation saying, I can relate to him or her. Man, that really touched me. I can do what he or she said. I'd never seen that before. I hadn't thought of that before. And it's possible you may have seen Mark Hunter's talk before from 09, but hadn't seen exactly what he did with his wheelchair on that day. If you want to shine, and I believe we all do, I want to shine on stage, look at every asset you have from your accent, your personality, your stories, your experiences. And how do you bring them to life? You make the characters come alive. We want to see and hear them. And sometimes, because we are speakers, we believe we have to speak. However, sometimes the best language or the best words are not. Sometimes the body can do all the speaking for us. It may sound like a really, a really what's the word I want, maybe goofy exercise, 
but I, I, mean, I thought it is several, several days ago. It would be fun, I think, for us to maybe grab some, an item that will block our face off and see if we can get the audience to see our picture. What is our emotion based on our eyes only? Go to a mirror one day or even record stuff on Zoom or on a video and just kind of block this eyes only and ask yourself, okay, I'm going to give an emotion right now. Will the audience see it? And by the way, I say this because it's more important now, virtually. All we have is this. So your face does so much more than it did on a large stage. Your face is so critical now. So if I show an emotion in the chat, what do you see here from emotion? In the chat, what do you see? Give me, come on, yeah. Anger, bingo, anger it is, angry eyes, yes. Perfect, thank you all who said angry, okay? If I do this, what do you see? Surprise, shock, are you kidding me? What? Exactly. It's these small things the audience sees. If the audience sees this, what do you think? Smile, but... Ah, oh, thank you. Insincere, fake smile, phony. <laughs> Boom! You get the idea. Here's the thing. When you're delivering virtually, your audience picks up on all of this. That's why I encourage everyone to rehearse by re recording yourself first and then watching yourself. Because you want to ask yourself a question. Is my facial expression congruent with the message I'm sending to the audience at this point in time? Is my facial expression congruent with the, with the emotion I want the audience to get from this particular character in this particular scene? When you put all these together, it's part of the experience that your audience has. Friends, I wish I had two hours to really drill down deep on all of these techniques. But I believe you and I can all truly shine on stage when first we understand we have to bring our audience home to us before we begin our presentation. We can do that by establishing before rapport. Have those conversations. Interact with the audience. If you're in a virtual meeting, enter the networking room. Have a conversation. Answer questions. There's something else you can do. You can write your introduction in a way that sets the audience up to hear what you have to say. You were told today in my introduction that I quote speakers, that I host a podcast about presentations, which gives you the credibility, which gives me credibility for you to say, okay, he's been teaching this, he's been doing this, maybe I should listen to what he has to say. Give your audience time to get to know you, to focus on you when you first take the platform. Establish that connection when you get their attention, and as often as possible, make sure the connection is also tied to your presentation. Be less concerned about eloquence and be more concerned about the impact by being conversational when you give your presentation. Remember authenticity plus vulnerability, being willing to share your, your, your life with them will give you credibility. Why? Because the audience says, ah, I'm not the only one who has done that. Oh, he has kids. I have kids. He's a grandma. I'm a grandfather. I can relate to that. When you have that relationship with your audience, even if you're giving a technical presentation, make sure that the technical data is encoused or surrounded by a story. You wrap the data in a story to make it relatable to your audience. Your story is more powerful than you think. It need not be sensational. It just has to be sincere. Why? Your audience wants to hear you, but they really want to know you. Don't report. Transport, don't narrate, bring us to the scene, become the characters, use the Goldilocks effect, do a Clark Kent Superman, use these techniques, become the characters, the voice, the body, all of those things, and use your platform, both physical on a large live stage or even virtual in ways that the emotion of the moment will connect with your audience 
And remember, in a virtu on a virtual stage, all you have is a small window. Every move, every facial expression will convey an emotion. It is my belief, if you do these things well, you will shine on stage and online. If you want to get a hold of me, I'm not that hard to find. I'm hi highly Googleable. You can Google Mark Brown Speaker. You can certainly go to my website, markbrownspeaks.com, to find out more. I am also a professional speaking coach. And you can also learn about one of the best podcasts on the planet, the Unforgettable Presentations Podcast. Listen, I'm going to be in a breakout room for half an hour in about 35.298176 seconds. Feel free to join me. we have a conversation. We'll get to know each other more. I want to help you not only present well, I believe you can and that you will shine both on stage and online. Franca, over to you.